Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to our AIB webinar series featuring the latest research from the, our two journals, the Journal of International Business Studies and the Journal of International Business Policy. My name is Klaus Meyer and I'll be your host today. I'm a professor at the Ivy Business School in Canada. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the co-tech tech staff who make sure that the technology works, such as slide forwarding here. Okay, this uh, is a co venture between the two journals of the association. So I thank the editors in chief for their support, but of course also the incoming president. There's a new picture you can see compared to the last time we had a webinar, the president of the ARB. Technology support comes from the ARB secretary as well as from digital motion and uh, the series is coordinated by myself and Nadana Binbayar from Copenhagen. We are uh, picked three papers for discussion today. So the basic idea of this series is that we share research that has been published and discuss the implications from this research, whether the policy implications, but also what, what further research do we need, right? So it is about talking about the research but it's also talking about the implication for this research for practice. We try to blend experience and junior people in the field. Actually, today we have quite a young crowd. Maybe that's because the topic is so hot and topical. Um, you can participate in the uh, discussion through the Q&A function. So the whole idea is that we have a lot of this dialogue and conversation and in a webinar format, that happens through uh, the Q&A. You put your questions there. You can actually also vote for questions. That's kind of cute. Uh, Erin Bass, who is the co-host uh, co today and will moderate the discussion, will read your questions and then pick up the questions to ask uh, the panelists. So I told you it's a hot topic. The topic is how do multinational enterprises engage with policies aimed at promoting green energy? And it's a really hot topic in view of the policy debates. There's a big meeting in Glasgow starting next week where policymakers are gonna set new rules and multinational enterprises are going to respond to that one way or another. So having an understanding of the thinking in a multinational enterprise when they see these evolving rules uh, will help us a lot in these discussions. The person who's gonna lead us through the discussion is Erin Bast, who is one of the two editors of the special issue that uh, JITS has just published on the topic of energy transition. The second uh, co-editor that Erin worked with is Birgit Krego, who is uh, from, from Norway. So we have American and a European perspective, which by the way, we have uh, among the speakers as well. Erin uh, just shared with me, she comes from the oil and gas industry. So she was with the bad guys, the green people would say. Um, but she's engaged with the energy industry herself in many ways, first as a practitioner, then and as a scholar, and has in her scholarly work covered both the traditional oil and gas and alternative energies. So I don't think she has a strong view in favor of one or the other, uh, but she is a, a ideally positioned to guide us through this discussion. Erin, over to you. Great, thank you so much for that introduction. I love that I was introduced as coming from the bad guys. That's that's great. No, I'm just really excited. Thank you, Klaus. Um, thank you everyone who's joined us today. You know, I, I love this topic. I'm so excited to engage with the presenters and the audience on green energy and multinational enterprises. So just a few words before we get into our presentation. You know, when we think about green energy policies, those are becoming more and more prevalent for all organizations, but especially MEs. And when we think about green energy policies, we're really kind of getting at those measures that are aimed to align the structure of like a country's energy sector with our needs, our global needs for sustainable development. So on the surface, you know, for MEs, green energy policies will affect things like reporting and operations, so mandatory or voluntary reporting of greenhouse gas, gas emissions, um, renewable or use of renewable energy, purchasing of renewable energy credits, 
um, sourcing renewable energy. So on the surface, we know that MEs are grappling with those reporting and operations type issues. But when we take a deeper look into green energy policies and MEs, and I think what you're going to hear from in our presenters today, we start to think about how MEs shape and are shaped by green energy policies. So when we take that perspective of thinking about how MEs shape and are shaped by those green energy policies in conjunction with this global energy transition from non-renewables to renewables, um, we can really start to dive into, I would say, three related facets of MEs and green energy. So the first facet of the role of MEs um, shaping and being shaped by green energy policies is looking at how MEs help drive those policies. So the role of MEs and help shaping what those policies might look like, and therefore kind of being at the front end of shaping the long energy transition. So that's kind of one facet that we're going to hear about today. The second thing that we can think about um, is the operational changes in the energy system. So energy generation, storage, infrastructure, consumption, um, those all affect ME operations, and we're going to hear a little bit about how that, how those operational changes really drive new business models within the energy sector. And then the third thing that we really can think about is how MEs contribute to those desired outcomes that these policies, um, like the policies, are trying to create. So environmental sustainability, energy security, energy accessibility. So. Again, today we're going to hear a little bit about how MEs can help contribute to those positive outcomes that these policies are, are there to create. So, given those kind of three kind of deeper dive things that we're going to hear from today, you know, we as um, audience members, as scholars, as practitioners, as those who help influence the policies, we can really take this seat of like we're living in this long energy transition and as we do we are starting to understand more and more about how MEs shape and are shaped by these policies and given that global reach how that affects long-term energy transition across the globe so with that i'm really excited about each of the presentations we'll hear from today because they all consider those different facets of that deeper dive and how MEs engage with green energy policies and the outcomes of doing so. So, without further ado, I would like to start today's presentation with Francesca Chuli, and she is joining us from Tilburg University in the Netherlands. So, Francesca, over to you. Thank you very much. So, I'm going to uh, share my screen. Um, okay. Um, so thank you very much, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Francesca Ciulli uh, from Tilburg University. Um, and uh, I'm going to present today briefly the paper that I co-authored with Rene Bonsack and Hans Kolk on the role of business models uh, in firm internationalization, uh, where we explore European electricity firms uh, in the context uh, of the energy transitions. So first of all, a few words about uh, our theoretical background. So the study is grounded on the concept of uh, firm-specific advantages, or FSAs, uh, which have been defined as a firm's unique uh, knowledge resource bundles in which uh, uh, it had invested as uh, the foundation of survival, uh, value creation, and growth. We particularly build uh, on the distinction of FSAs into location-bound and non-location-bound FSAs. We also build on the concept of FSAs uh, recombination combination, which uh, uh, is the need for an ME to enhance the value of its non-location bound FSAs by combining and melding them with the location specific assets in uh, foreign markets. When looking at the IB research on FSAs, uh, we observed that this literature had hinted that FSAs may also encompass the whole business model of a firm, but it did not elaborate further on this connection. Uh, when looking beyond the literature on FSAs, so at the whole literature on internationalization, we noticed that this body of work had uh, not studied in detail the role and the potential of the business model concept in relation to firm internationalization, and uh, let alone in the context of a grand challenge like the energy transition. 
So we therefore reflected uh, on the fact that uh, recent developments, uh, both in the non-IB literature and in the real world, uh, suggest that it is important to update the conceptualization of FSAs. And we can summarize uh, these important developments into two main ones. So first, uh, when uh, it internationalizes during technology intensive changes, uh, like the energy transition, a firm has to consider that innovative technologies per se have only latent value. So and un as underlined by uh, business model studies in strategic management literature, in order to realize economic, but uh, we could also say environmental and social value, um, inherent to a new technology, uh, a firm, and more specifically uh, a multinational, needs to combine the new technology with a suitable uh, business model. Second, uh, value co-creation with external actors, so for example in the case of decentralized energy systems, has become increasingly critical for firms and uh, has been uh, taken uh, to be taken into account when they internationalize. So in this context, the business model concept uh, could allow really to apprehend the central role of external actors in a firm's international expansions. So based on these observations, we considered particularly valuable to establish a connection between the FSA concept and the business model concept. And we propose in our study the concept of business model specific advantages or BMSAs. We define BMSAs as a configuration of location-bound and non-location-bound activities that as a whole lead to a FSA. Uh, we propose that the BMSA concept enriches the FSA concept by adding to it a higher order configurational character, because it really allows to capture the bundle of activities that create and capture value and the link uh, to external actors as well. So building on the BMSA concept, we developed a conceptual framework for BMSA location boundedness. And this framework has on one dimension, uh, as you can see in the slide, uh, the business model components so that we distinguished into a value proposition, value network, and the revenue and cost model. On the other dimension, there is the degree of uh, BMSA location boundedness, which is a continuum. Based on this conceptual framework, a firm's BMSA may present a different degree of location boundedness, depending on the location boundedness of the individual components. And you see here uh, an example. Um, stemming from uh, the BMSA concept and the conceptual framework of BMSA location boundedness that we had developed, uh, our study aimed to answer the following research question. So what role do BMSAs play in the internationalization of firms in the context of the energy transition? We chose as empirical setting the EU electricity sector uh, for our study uh, because it, had undergone, uh, it has undergone a set of critical transformations, which uh, are particularly relevant both from a business model perspective and from an internationalization perspective. And these are the shifts from a centralized to a decentralized energy system, the increasing but still uneven liberalization, and the transition, the transformation that has been triggered by the digitalization wave. So these changes has led to an heterogeneous landscape with the traditional business models coexisting with novel business models and the varying degrees of internationalization. Our finding consisted in the identification of a set of barriers uh, that hinder BMSA recombination in foreign markets. And we identified the three main barriers, regulatory market and infrastructural. We defined then BMSA recombination barriers as factors that are inherent to foreign markets, which make it highly difficult or impossible for the focal firms to recombine their BMSA with the local assets uh, that they need. We also observed that our cases varied both in the degrees of BMSA location boundedness and in the degree uh, to which they experienced BMSA recombination barriers. So we uh, uh, therefore developed a framework that you can see uh, in the slide of BMSA internationalization and we plot plotted our cases in the framework. We then connected the position of the firms with their internationalization. And we observed, for example, uh, that the firms in cell one had a high degree of internationalization because it could internationalize, it internationalize by essentially transferring their BMSA and bundle it with the local assets in foreign markets. 
Conversely, uh, the case is in cell four where traditional utilities, uh, which have not expanded internationally, but uh, have remained local because of high BMSA location boundedness and uh, high recombination barriers in the potential host markets. So the main takeaways for our studies, uh, study are uh, three. So first, uh, to improve the understanding of internationalization, we need to assess whether uh, a firm's BMSA is no location bound or location bound, and whether the recombination barriers in a potential or existing host country are high or low. Second, uh, different degrees of BMSA location boundedness may not necessarily lead to different internationalization decisions. And one needs to consider the cost and the risk uh, of BMSA adaptation. Third, particularly uh, relevant from an energy transition perspective, we observed a different experience between utilities with the traditional business model and new entrants with new business models, often uh, leveraging uh, digital technologies. So the traditional utilities on one side experienced a high BMSA location boundedness and high recombination barriers. And as a consequence, they saw the uh, electricity market as high, highly fragmented and localized, hampering their internationalization. The second group instead uh, sees BMSA adaptation as less costly and less risky, and they experience an international uh, relatively integrated electricity market, which facilitates uh, their internationalization. In terms of future research uh, avenues, uh, particularly uh, for uh, related to the energy transition, but not only, uh, I would like to highlight the three main avenues. So first of all, uh, we are observing, particularly with the diffusion of blockchain, uh, the emergence of decentralized business models where there is uh, no dominant organization. So this would lead to a shift from a business model firm specific advantage to a business model specific advantage. So future research uh, could uh, really explore this shift uh, and uh, the implication of internationalization of these uh, decentralized business models uh, and uh, business model specific advantages. Second, uh, our, our one study uh, did not take a longitudinal perspective, but it would be very interesting to explore longitudinally uh, the co-evolution between the BMSAs and BMSA recombination barriers and the energy and climate related institutions that are relevant for uh, MEs across countries, but also at supranational level. Level. Third, uh, future research could advance the conceptualization of BMSAs by unpacking the environmental and social value creation and implications, also uh, by leveraging the uh, literature on sustainable business models and explore uh, with these uh, the implication for internationalization. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Francesca. That was really interesting. And I, what I really appreciate about your paper and your presentation is that you take that idea that things can't be done the way that they've always been done, right? That we need to do something different because this is a, a really a different world that we're living in. So thank you for sharing that with us. Really interesting. We'll hear from our, our next speaker, Marcus Tosic. He's joining us from Rutgers University in New Jersey, and he will be presenting his paper for us. So thank you. Over to you, Marcus. Thank you. Um, so terrific first presentation by Francesca. Thanks so much for that. Um, setting the bar high for the rest of us. Um, so the, the um, Francesca's paper was a theoretical paper. Um, Ours is, is much more of an empirical paper, though, of, of course, we're also thinking about theory in, in ours as, as well. Um, sorry, let me uh, share my slides. So this is a, this is a paper uh, together with um, two, two co-authors. Um, so one is my, my former doctoral uh, classmate, Sanjay Patnaik. Uh, who's now director of the Center on Regula Regulation and Markets at the Brookings Institution um, in Washington, D.C., uh, here in the United States. Um, and uh, the other is Michael Nipa, um, at, uh, uh, who is, is a professor of strategic leadership and international management uh, at the Bozen Balzano, um, uh, at the Free University of Bo Bozen Balzano in Italy. Um, so both both of my co-authors are true experts in 
in the interaction between uh, business and climate change. Um, so working with them has been a terrific learning experience for me as, the, as this is a, a new area for me. Um, I came to the table with uh, my own focus on host country institutions, on uh, regulatory compliance, um, and, and on the role of uh, the impact of multinationality on firms' strategies. Um, so our different perspectives led us to a, a lot of debating, arguing um, with each other with each other throughout the process that I think actually had really good um, impact on on the final paper. So uh, our our starting point was uh, you know just uh, observing the the broader broader discussion uh, in the news in popular conversation. Um, uh, uh, about climate and business and multinationality and, and the dramatically different uh, views we're seeing. So on the one hand, you know, we're seeing, we, we, we're consistently seeing messages that multinationals are the only hope uh, that we have uh, to get out of the crisis that we're in. Uh, at other times we're hearing, no, 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 uh, multinationals are, are truly the cause and, 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 and are, are continuing to undermine efforts to, to, uh, to solve this problem. Um, then, then we also hear, uh, ah, it looks like uh, maybe multinationals, uh, big business is turning a corner. Um, uh, but no, no, uh, they're, they're, it, maybe what they're doing is, is much more of a marketing exercise, turning, turning the marketing up to 11 um, and, and not actually uh, not actually bringing about solutions. Uh, the, the word multinationality is not always there, um, but when multi, the word multinationality comes in, it, it, our observation is that it tends to quite often be a negative one. Uh, so this is this this broader uh, conversation, of course, has been engaged in, uh, engaged with by by academics uh, before us, um, again, including my, my two co-authors. Um, but, uh, but as we interpret it, there, there, there isn't sort of a settled answer on what is the, re what is the relationship, what is the causal relationship between multinationality uh, and, and firms' carbon performance. Um, and we think this is for a, a variety of reasons. So data challenges seems fairly clearly to be one of the, one of the issues. Um, so it's, it's very difficult uh, to put together a legitimate data set um, connecting uh, firms to carbon emissions at large enough scale and across country borders. Um, and so this, this is a, a big challenge that's, that's uh, I think, made it more difficult for this question to be answered. Um, there's also the fact that certain firms are more visible. Um, both just by the nature of, of uh, for example, being foreign or being multinational, um, or sometimes because they're more willing to be uh, more willing to be visible, um, more responsive, for example. So multinationals, um, the the characteristics of multinationals may lend them lend itself to them being more visible, po possibly even their their bad deeds, their their carbon emissions uh, being more visible, and and that creating bias that makes uh, systematic study more difficult. Um, we, uh, so we, we've done a, a good amount of work as, again, especially for, for me, it's been significant work to kind of catch up on the work uh, that's been done by previous scholars. Um, and we see certain, uh, issues there too, that have perhaps, uh, held up, uh, the, the question that we're asking being uh, fully answered before before we uh, got to it. So what, one of the issues we as, as we see it is that there's been a real focus um, in a lot of the work on understanding the adaptation strategies of multinationals themselves um, and a bit less so a focus on thinking about the ultimate effect of those um, of those strategies again, recognizing that it's that's in part because of data constraints and, and the difficulty of studying the ultimate effect. Um, another observation of ours is that there is a good deal of values driven focus in, in the literature. Um, so what I mean by that is that there you do see uh, papers and scholars uh, falling into um, opposing camps. Uh, and some some degree of them preaching to one another's separate choirs and and a little bit 
of a struggle to engage uh, between different perspectives um, in, in, in this realm. Um, and then the, the final, the final uh, point I want to emphasize um, is one that's particularly relevant for us and the way we, we're aiming to differentiate our work is that we see a, a neglect of comparison of multinationals to the alternative, uh, which is domestic only firms. Uh, so to, to understand how multinationals are, are different, one would need to be comparing them to this, uh, to this, uh, uh, to this alternative. Uh, so uh, a paper that we particularly, um, or actually a series of papers, uh, you know, a, a body of work that we see our, our work as particularly connecting to and building on is that of uh, Alan Rugman and uh, Elaine uh, Verbeke, the, um, the editor-in-chief of JIBS. Um, and, and I just wanted to put up this, this one quote from, from uh, their 1998 paper. We do not find empirical support for the race to the bottom hypothesis, nor ambiguous conceptual report, uh, support for the race to the top hypothesis, both as special cases within the FSA CSA framework of m and &E strategy towards environmental regulation. So um, fortunately, uh, the FSA has already been explained in, in great detail by the previous uh, presentation. Um, so firm specific advantage. Uh, CSA then is country specific advantage. And, and so we're, we're thinking about that framework a lot in, in our work. So what do we do in, in our paper? Um, so we're uh, building and analyzing plant level emissions uh, data. This was um, work that was done uh, by my, my co-author Sanjay Patnaik especially, um, uh, and, and, and then uh, by RAs that he, that he uh, hired subsequently after his doctoral studies as well. Um, and, uh, and our focus is the European Union and phase two of its, uh, of its uh, emissions trading system. Um, so uh, phase one was more of a pilot phase. So we, fa uh, we, we focus on phase two uh, for that reason. Um, we, uh, we also, it, it's important to note that the, the European Union's ETS is essentially the, the most rigorous uh, regulatory system for, for carbon emissions in the world. And so um, that, we think that makes it special and worthy of, of study as well. Um, and in, in our, re our research, we're capitalizing on the fact that within the European Union, um, you do have important and, and uh, impactful uh, host country institutional uh, variation. So you have variation in the adoption of carbon tax schemes within the ETS, and you have um, variation in the evolution of market institutions. So uh, when, I, when I note that um, the, the latter uh, type of variation, I'm specifically referring to the difference between Western Europe and Eastern Europe and the fact that the Eastern European countries have been rapidly catching up with the rest of the, um, the union in terms of their market orientation. And so what the, especially the way we're thinking of that is the, the bottom, the sort of minimum standards uh, enforced by regulatory, um, the regulatory of authority of, of the state um, on, on businesses has been, has been rising uh, much more rapidly in the Eastern European countries. Um, and we develop hypotheses uh, based on the review of the literature that I described earlier. Um, we're especially framing, uh, as I noted already, um, within the Rugman and Verbeke uh, framework. Um, and a fundamental assumption that we're making is that m and &E behavior is driven by rational, self-interested um, economic assessments. All right, so we have three hypotheses. Um, our, our first one is the kind of broad baseline one where we're, we're saying that we think that holding everything else constant, m and are gonna exhibit better behavior, carbon performance behavior relative to the domestic only um, uh, competitors. And uh, in, in this particular setting of, of increased carbon price regulations. And we do find support for that. In particular, we find about 2% percentage points lower average carbon emissions uh, for the m and than for their domestic competitors. Um, the second hypothesis is, is taking advantage of that um, country heterogeneity and, um, and looking at what the effect is. When, uh, so we're, 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 we're saying that we think that the effect is going to be um, 
uh, sorry, we, we're, we're predicting that the uh, that when you have carbon tax systems, when you have multiple types of carbon uh, regulation, um, that you're going to see a um, an, an enhancement in the ME advantage um, on carbon performance. And again, we do find support for that. So in particular, we find two percentage points lower emissions for the MEs specifically in these countries that had carbon tax schemes. Um, and uh, then our final hypothesis is that uh, that actually we're going to see the largest uh, the, that that advantage um, for the MEs uh, be reduced in the countries where where you've seen these Im improvements in uh, in in the market institutions. And so consistent with that, we indeed we do see that there's seven percent larger um, seven percent better emissions performance for the MEs in the Western European uh, countries in particular. All right, I'm, I'm actually looking at the time. I think that, that I'm, I'm, uh, I've gone a little bit slow and so I probably am uh, coming right up against my, uh, my time limit. Um, and so I wanna lay out the, um, the implications fairly quickly. Um, so I think what we, our, our big takeaway in terms of implications is that Sure, we're, we're showing that multinationals are, are performing better than their domestic counterparts, um, and that this means that they should be seen as part of the solution. Um, but let's not fool ourselves and think that this is because of any sort of public interest orientation on the, on the part of MEs. And let's remember um, that ultimately uh, the key solution is going to come through public policy, uh, pu public policy um, solutions. So um, again, with, with an awareness of the time, I think um, I'll, I'll just sort of uh, uh, point to the future research uh, that I have here. We, we, we found a whole bunch of findings that I didn't get to in my presentation that we think can be built on. Um, there, we, we definitely think we're scratching the surface. We think our data potentially is gonna be of use uh, to others. And, and we look forward to where the research goes from here. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Marcus. It's really interesting. Um, and I think your paper especially gets at that idea of how MEs shape and are shaped by these green energy policies and then their contribution to the outcomes that the policies are there to create. So really appreciate that. Um, our third and final paper for today will be presented by Panikos Georgialis of the University of Amsterdam, also in Netherlands. So Panikos, I'll pass it off to you. Thank you very much, Erin. Uh, let me just quickly share my screen. Okay, uh, so thanks again for inviting me to be on this panel and uh, great to be with Francesca and Marcus and two excellent uh, papers already presented. Um, so the paper I'm going to present today was uh, published in the Journal of International Business Studies and it's titled Jurisdiction Shopping and Foreign Location Choice, the role on market and non-market experience in the European solar energy industry. Uh, so it's a paper co-authored with uh, Joao Albino Pimentel and uh, Nina Contradenko. And uh, I'll, I'll start with the context here because the context is really, really important. Um, the context of the study is uh, solar energy. And we looked at uh, the emergence, uh, the period of the emergence of solar energy in Europe, um, a time when really uh, there was a revolution in, in the industry and, and the market for solar energy. And as you can see here on this uh, slide on, on the right side, um, during the period that we analyzed, uh, about 10 years from 2004 to 2013, Europe was the leading market uh, for solar energy uh, and the market was really uh, going, uh, growing very, very fast. Um, this was largely because of policies. So it, it was a policy driven market, especially feeding tariff policies uh, have, um, a lot of people have attributed the uh, expansion of the market to feeding tariff policies. And there is also strong evidence in the literature that policies had a strong impact on domestic markets and, and the behavior of uh, firms in domestic markets. What, what we were wondering about with, with my co-authors was whether these policies attract foreign entrants and more importantly, what kind of firms uh, do these policies attract? What kind of firms are attracted to industry support policies in foreign markets? So we looked to the international business literature and 
and we found less than we thought that we'll find actually. Um, so on the one hand, we have the research that looks at policies as formal institutions. Uh, so institutions set the rules of the game by which firms need to abide, uh, the boundaries um, that they need to operate within. And, and because of that, th there has been an emphasis in that literature on, on homogenous effects and on policies as a constraint on, on what firms can do. If we look at the literature on international location choices, uh, there's a lot of work that acknowledges that because countries' policy environments differ, uh, multinationals select their location by engaging in jurisdiction shopping. So essentially uh, screening uh, the regulatory context, the institutional context in different countries and shopping around to go to the best possible place. Typically, this has been seen as avoiding uh, countries with stringent pollution control or employment protection laws and, or, or higher taxes. There, have been, there has been less attention to policies that support uh, specific industries, which is very relevant, of course, uh, when we're talking about uh, green energy. And what is more is that we also know much less about how uh, this varies with firm characteristics, how the attraction of firms uh, to countries with stronger environmental legislation uh, is different across different firms. So the focus of this study was to address exactly that. And we tried to explore variation in international location choices uh, in reaction to supportive policies in foreign countries. Our setting is investments in solar energy in uh, all European Union uh, countries, formerly 28 European Union countries uh, from 2004 to 2013. And the key premise that we started with was that while we see jurisdiction shopping usually as an avoidance strategy, so firms trying to avoid uh, the risk of, of some uh, locations, but also firms scan the policy environment for opportunities. So we started with that, and that brings us to, the, to our first, uh, I think, pretty straightforward argument that supportive policies can be a country-specific advantage uh, for a number of reasons. First, support by a powerful actor like the state grants legitimacy to the industry and makes it easier for firms to, to invest, uh, but also because attractive market conditions that are not necessarily st strictly uh, set to benefit local firms can also benefit foreign firms. And in fact, if we look at the case of feed-in tariffs in solar energy, they offer investment incentives, they offer, uh, essentially, they allow for greater demand, but who is going to meet that demand is up for grabs. Who is going to uh, benefit from that is up for grabs. So we expect that uh, when there are more generous industry support policies in a country, uh, there's a greater likelihood that the firm will choose to invest in that particular country. Now, it gets, more, it gets more interesting when we try to think about how that differs with firms and, and different uh, types of firms. We know that uh, companies differ in their ability to conceive of the benefits of particular institutions or, or uh, regulation uh, and also the, to capture those benefits. And we also know that experience is very important. Firms that have more experience may be more able to identify what kind of information to look for, uh, what are the implications of uh, the policies for the firm, and how to analyze these policies and potentially enter those countries. So firm experience can be a firm-specific advantage for international location choices. However, the typical assumption has been that more experience is better. But the effects of experience may also be domain-specific, so it may depend on the type of experience and also on the nature of experience that a firm has obtained through its previous uh, operations. So we differentiate between type and nature of firm experience. So what do we mean by type of firm experience? Well, first we look to market experience, which is experience with the same industry, the same market. So in this case, solar. And we expect that it will uh, increase the tendency of firms to expand abroad in the same industry. So the more they know the market, the more likely they are to expand abroad. However, it doesn't necessarily imply that they're able to address the policy environment, the non-market environment in these other countries. Non-market experience, so experience with the non-market environment, the policy environment, is more likely to equip these firms with the ability to evaluate similar policies, and be able to respond to similar policies in foreign countries, 
because they incorporate policy considerations more centrally, because they establish routines for how to deal with subsidies and how to, how to obtain them. And that makes it easier for them to invest in other countries that have the same types of policies. So we argue that non-market experience positively moderates the impact of supportive policy on location choice, and that this moderating impact of non-market experience is stronger than the moderating impact of market experience. Next, we look to the nature of firm experience. Um, we know that companies, MEs, they tend to consider new markets or, or new countries more seriously when the conditions in their home regions are more adverse. So when there's more competitiveness in, in their home region or when there are stronger institutional uh, constraints. And that can lead us to think that they will be looking, they will more likely to be looking abroad for places with generous policies. However, if they have first, if they have faced policy changes, adverse policy changes in their operations in their home country or host country, so significant reductions of subsidies or repeals of policies, that may lead them to become averse to other countries that employ the same policies. So they may not be as interested in going to countries that have generous policies because they're more skeptical of them. They consider them as more risky. So we expect that the effect of a generous policy and location choice will be weaker for those firms that have had adverse non-market experience. So what we find, uh, we do find that in this setting, there is on average a, a race to the top. So firms engage in jurisdiction shopping to try to go to the countries that has, have the most generous industry support policies. However, what, what's more interesting is the variation across firms. We see that this pattern of jurisdiction shopping is more prominent for firms that have relevant non-market experience, but not those with relevant market experience. We don't find that effect. And we also see that uh, this pattern is weaker for firms that have had adverse experience. So if they first, uh, so even if they had a lot of experience, if they faced adverse policy conditions, then they're less likely to enter these countries with generous policies. And through some of the other robustness tests, we also find that policy supported caricatures, location choice across the board for different kinds of firms, but the effects of experience are more pronounced for those MEs that come from other sectors as opposed to renewable energy specialists. In terms of uh, what we think are interesting future research directions, this is a very uh, open topic, I think. So we know that firms respond differently to public policies outside the jurisdictions, but what, what other factors uh, that we haven't studied here might shape these choices? And also, how do managers make sense of these opportunities in practice? How do they think of them? How do they understand them? Uh, how do they engage in decision-making? What are the macro foundations of these decisions? Uh, I think there's also interest in uh, potential for looking at industry support policies and market emergence domestically or internationally. A lot of research on this has focused on green markets, to what extent does supportive policy stimulate other moral markets. We also unpacked international experience here. So it's not a unidimensional construct, uh, but what are the other relevant dimensions beyond the market or non-market distinction? Also, we we want to point out that we know that the depth and breadth of experience is important and it has been acknowledged in the past, but also it's important to look at the nature of MNE's experience. It's not just how long they've been in a country or how many countries they've been to, but also what kind of experience have they, uh, have they faced. So in what context and under what conditions is adverse experience relevant? And finally, we also see that adverse experience affects how companies view policies in other countries that they have not uh, been at yet. So how can policymakers guard against these uh, spillovers in perceived policy risks? So these are just some ideas uh, for future research and I look forward to discussing others as well uh, with the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Panikos. That was uh, very interesting. You know, what I love about your paper is you really look at pairing unique attributes of the m and &E with the policy itself, right? So it's kind of not a one size fits all approach. It's really how do the policies mean or how are they meaningful differently for these different m and &Es? So that was really wonderful. Um, at this point, I would like to open up the Q&A. 
um, so that we can get some great questions from our audience. So just go ahead and pop the question uh, in here. Our first one is actually from Michael Nippa. So Michael, welcome. You are one of the co-authors on uh, Marcus's paper. So uh, glad to have you. Um, so he poses to the group a more general comment or question. Are the really bad guys not the global consumers, i.e. we all demanding more and more energy at lower and lower prices? Energy is a human right, some put forward, while refusing in some countries even CO2 solutions such as nuclear power or CCS. Um, and how can we do research, including this perspective, a little bit more? So Marcus, since you are uh, Michael's co-author, I'm going to actually ask you to start off this discussion really thinking about the implications of us consumers on uh, the industry, the policies, and specifically the role of m &Es. Well, I'll, I'll just start by saying it's uh, totally unfair of Michael since he's the climate change ec expert and, and I'm not. Um, <laughs> but but no, we're, we're, he and I are, are very much on the same page uh, about uh, how much of a, um, uh, how, how much this problem is one that everyone has responsibility for and tends to always push it off onto the sort of the easiest others uh, the, the easiest solution of having other people solve uh, for them. And, and so uh, what we would, what he and I and, and Sanjay over and over came back to is, is the importance of policy. And so I guess what, what my main response to, to Michael's question would be to, to say, I, I really do think, I mean, and, and I think, and we, we saw that in, in, in the other two papers uh, already, um, I really do think it's important that us international business researchers uh, don't run away from policy discussion and don't always assume that the solution, just because we're at business schools, doesn't mean we have to make businesses the main actors that solve the problems. We can, we can, uh, we can be advocating for constraints on business or um, uh, government help in in taking those costs uh, and, and, and making sure they're, they're borne by businesses. And so that businesses in their, their decision-making have to uh, recognize these, these spillover costs. Great, thank you. Panikos, let's, uh, let's hear your take on this. I know you, you know a lot about solar, right? And the solar industry and kind of consumer and business um, interactions in that industry. So let's hear your take on Michael's question. Yeah, I think I would agree with Marcus, actually. So uh, the, the question is certainly provocative, right? Uh, are, are we all the bad guys? Are we consumers the bad guys? And I think there's something to be said about, you know, uh, pushing consumers a little bit more to think about their, you know, everyday choices, uh, but also choices that they make about energy, which we usually don't think about, right? Uh, what kind of energy we purchase and so on. Uh, and there's certainly, uh, it's certainly important to try to push businesses also to invest in green energy uh, and sustainability in general. But I, I would agree with Marcus that, uh, you know, if we just do that, we're, we might be barking at the wrong tree. I think uh, most of the significant changes have come from policy, of, often with, you know, of course, the involvement of business and consumers, but driven by, uh, by policy. So I think it's really important to think about our role, not just as consumers, but also as voters. Uh, that, that would be my take. That's fantastic. Thank you, Panikos. And uh, Francesca, do you want to take a stab at this question about the role of consumers in the green energy transition? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think maybe what uh, what I can add uh, is that I think the role of consumers is increasingly interesting because the consumer can also be an, a producer and uh, also for, with digital technology, they can be really active agents in uh, controlling what they pro what is uh, what they consume and uh, managing their consumption, their efficiency, etc. So. I think of particularly from an international business perspective, exploring how models that uh, try to involve actively consumers as producers, as manager, managers of their energy consumption can be replicated across countries, what models are successful globally and can be scaled internationally, um, what models cannot. And uh, so, so I think it would be interesting to see consumers in, in their different uh, facets as, that they are acquiring today, thanks also to digitalization. And, uh, and there may be another thing that 
yeah, I think I can add, yeah, I understand obviously consumers have a very important role, but it's also important, yeah, to consider the issue of energy poverty, which is also a key problem and uh, make also things much more complex in terms of sustainability because we need to bring everything together. So that's uh, a challenge uh, for the future as well. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, I really like that take, the take from all of our presenters of how much more agentic consumers are generally. Right. Like we know that consumers have more of a voice and have more influence on business and potentially policy than we did previously. And Panicos, I really like that idea of like, which tree are we barking up? Right. Because if we're only barking up one tree and one path, that might not be the, the most effective um, the most effective approach. So it was really interesting to hear that. Thank you, Michael, for the provocative question. We really appreciate it. Again, others um, that have attended the webinar, feel free to pop your Q&A into the, or your question into the Q&A. I'm actually going to um, ask a question of all of the presenters related to what is What's the next thing that you think is the most interesting? So I think Panikos, in your presentation, you shared like when you looked up kind of this approach to green energy, it was the field is wide open. And I couldn't help but notice all three of you in your future research slide, it was like, you know, a laundry list of different ideas. So if you had to pick kind of one next thing that you think would be incredibly relevant for the international business and policy literature, what do you think that might be? And Marcus, I'm gonna pass it over to you to start us off there. Sure, um, yeah, uh, I, I think the, the one that comes to mind for me first um, is that, uh, is, is our, our kind of surprising finding that we had in the paper that, um, that multinationals seem to be exhibiting the most, uh, the most that the, the advantage of multinationality on carbon performance was greatest uh, for plants that were in the home country. So, so multi, when multinationals were kind of at their origins um, with the, uh, um, amidst the populations that knew them best, where they had the longest history, um, all these various uh, characteristics of it being their home country, uh, that was where they were showing the, the greatest improvement in their carbon performance. And so we, in the paper, we, we take a stab at some of the possible explanations for that, but, but I think uh, we, we don't know. We, our, our study wasn't designed to, to uh, specifically um, delve into that issue. Uh, and so I, I, I'm really interested to see uh, further work, whether it's by us or, or by others um, uh, looking at that. Great, thank you for sharing, Marcus. Panikos, how about you? What do you think is kind of the next interesting thing in this area? Yeah, this is a tough one, but I think because I think there are a lot of interesting things to tackle, but uh, one that uh, is interesting for me is kind of to make a, a move from thinking about organizational outcomes for the M&E or for firms to kind of more collective outcomes. And it, in, in a sense, I think I, I really like what uh, Marcus and, and his uh, colleagues did that looking at you know, CO2 emissions, uh, but also I think it would be interesting to connect this literature on international business and policy uh, to the work on market emergence to look at how these you know, individual investments by m &Es, how do they accumulate to you know, create this energy transition? How does that vary across countries? How do they come together to build the infra infrastructure uh, and, and I think that what would be interesting also in relation to the previous comment that, that Francesca also made is thinking about the role of consumers, the in increasingly important role of consumers, especially in countries or in places where we transition from renewable energy being policy driven to being an industry or a market that can stand on its own, that is already cost competitive with um, traditional energy. I think those are all interesting questions and I can go on forever, but I'll just stick with that. 
I know I feel terrible. I, I'm forcing all of you to pick one and it's like, how do you just pick one, right? So that's great. Um, Francesca, how about you? And I think, you know, especially as provocative, what you said about, it's not just environmental sustainability, right? Like environmental sustainability is important. And Layla, I see your question in the chat. So we're gonna get to that question in just a second, but there's other outcomes too, right? There's energy security, there's um, energy accessibility. So what do you think is the next kind of interesting thing related to this topic? Yeah, so I think uh, it's, uh, oops, uh, yeah, so I think uh, the, the key, uh, that is a key issue that is related to the multiple sustainability implications uh, uh, of, uh, of the energy transition. So, yeah, I mentioned energy poverty, but also, uh, yeah, in, related to the question that I saw, uh, there is also the issue of the impact, for example, of the rare earth metals uh, uh, to produce batteries for storage, for example, uh, uh, human rights implications of that, environmental implications of that and something that I think makes the picture much more complex than in the past and it's fascinating but yeah it's also difficult to grasp uh, in its complex nature is the fact that today much more much many actors uh, are in, being involved in the energy sector what we call so there is a convergence so we see companies like Tesla like our manufacturing in theory that is uh, getting into the energy sector technology companies like google um, so are entering the energy sector so it's not like in the past where we had uh, the big utilities that were in charge of the whole chain and uh, did everything now there are multinationals from different sectors that are getting in decentralized models consumers uh, um, so the picture is very complex and yeah, at the same time, we need to, pick tra to keep track of these uh, different sustainability goals so uh, that everybody is on board on that. So I think uh, the future in its complexity, it's very fascinating to research. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so Layla's uh, question, which we kind of alluded to uh, in the last question, but I'm actually going to Panico. So I'm going to ask you about this specifically within solar. Um, so we lock, we talk about energy products, right? But we kind of um, talk less about how those ener those green energy products are made, which is typically with the use of non renewables. Um, and Layla gave the example of the Tesla mega factories as an example, but this is this is happening across the green energy products industry. So Panicos, do you want to just share a little bit about what you know that's happening in specifically with solar and maybe um, some trends or changes that are happening related to the use of non-renewables or the use of non-renewables to create these renewable energy products? Yeah, well, I, I, I think there are two two points that, that I want to raise. So one is the use of non-renewables to create them, which I think that's that's not a, a big issue in itself because that's something that can be changed in the long term. But the other one is also the, the use of natural resources uh, to create you know, solar panels and, and solar batteries. Uh, so one of the trends in the industry is that it's becoming more and more important to, to recycle uh, solar panels. Uh, so more and more companies are, are trying to engage with it. So that's, I think, uh, an important kind of business model to think about uh, for the future. Uh, but the most challenging part is what do we do with, with batteries and storage? Uh, because if we want to have, you know, more storage and batteries are getting, you know, cheaper and cheaper uh, these days, uh, we, we have to use, you know, resources like lithium and so on. And, and there are other, of course, uh, other materials that are being used. Uh, but those, I think, are, are more controversial because of the mining conditions uh, and because of the potential to, you know, to run out of these natural resources. So I think that's a bigger problem than the uh, use of kind of, you know, fossil fuel or non-renewable energy to, uh, to produce these, you know, panels, for example, or, or to produce wind turbines and so on. Because you can always uh, have a renewable power plant to, use, to, to kind of generate that energy. Uh, but we can't, you know, we don't have uh, infinite resources and uh, uh, to, to build solar batteries. So I think that's the biggest challenge to make those much more efficient. Well, that's great. And that actually ties a little bit to what Francesca said in her presentation about how, you know, the old way of doing things where we use these uh, 
mine for minerals, use the non-renewables, et cetera, to create this new product, uh, we might need to rethink some of that. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, Marcus, this question seems especially pertinent to your research. So Jialu Ma asks the following question, multinationals are taking voluntary actions or self-regulation, such as internal carbon pricing as a response to traditional carbon regulations. How do you think about research potential and current theory that can be tied toward that research direction? So Marcus, what are your thoughts on that question? Thank you, Jalou. Uh, okay. Um, so yeah, so, so you're, you're um, the, I, I guess the way I'm reading the question is it's, so it's number one, I guess I would say, uh, you know, I think there, as, as others have said, there's so many great directions to go in, in research. And so this one, this one certainly, uh, I think has plenty of, of promise. Um, I guess just what I'm, what I immediately think about is that uh, this is, yeah, there, there is some research. And I think, so I think you'll, you'll find it'll be productive to do some literature review on this. Um, that has been taking this path of saying that the um, the solution will come from voluntary uh, action on the private sector side. Uh, to some degree, I'm wanting to push back a little bit on that, or at least I, I hope that research that that does that takes this focus in the future will um, will have uh, will will recognize that that that's going to be that's going to be a path that some firms will follow. But that many other firms will not follow. So um, I guess one of the one of the ways uh, other researchers have have uh, thought about this is okay by doing it voluntarily, does that then give you a competitive advantage? Does distinguishing yourself in terms of being more showing yourself to be more environmentally responsible uh, give you a, a bottom line advantage? Um, so that and then that of course encourages more firms to do it. Um, so yeah, a lot of a lot of interesting directions to go with that type of work. Uh, that's fantastic. Thank you for for sharing that with us, Penningos. How about you? What do you think is a new research direction or theory that could be relevant? Uh, so I, I wanted to actually follow up on the previous one. Is that okay? Because I, um, I I remember there was a very interesting uh, review article. I think it was by uh, King and Toffel that looked at self-regulation, uh, not in the context of energy specifically, but uh, for environmental performance in general. And I think the conclusion that they came to is that when it's self-regulation only by businesses, it usually doesn't work in terms of the environmental outcome, but it does work occasionally when there is some other outside actor, like a, a third party, like an NGO or, or a governmental actor involved. Um, so in, in, in a sense, I think we have to look at uh, kind of what kinds of self-regulation are out there uh, to, to understand if it will be effective. But yeah, again, I think uh, I, I agree with, with Marcus that we can't leave it just at that. Great, thank you. And for Fra Francesca, let's hear from you on the same, same question. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree yeah, that uh, with uh, Panikos and Marcus uh, that uh, yeah, self-regulation alone uh, can be quite uh, difficult uh, to uh, be effective in achieving uh, the goals that uh, the ambitious goals that we have. So a combination of different uh, measures uh, uh, could be, uh, yeah, could be better uh, indeed. Yes. That's great. And I think too, you know, the the FSA, the CSA model um, that's used by a lot of the papers that are featured in the special issue, because it's it's such a relevant model to this particular context. But when we start thinking about maybe some other theoretical perspectives that could be helpful. So um, Panikos, you kind of mentioned the, the stakeholder perspective that could be helpful. Um, uh, thinking about institutional theory and how that might be helpful, then that that kind of switches our lens of how do we look at these problems from a different angle. So that could be that could be relevant. So I'm going to move on to the next question. Thank you for everyone for using the Q and A. It's been really helpful. Um, Ans Kolk. So we were actually speaking about this before the webinar started. Uh, as Glasgow is about to start, what would be your key takeaway for those negotiating there or for some of them or some countries or actor types? So Glasgow, of, of course, is starting in a few days. And um, 
you know, the, the, the idea that there's going to be negotiations, there's going to be influence. And so what would be the key takeaway from your research that would be uh, relevant to those discussions? So uh, Panikos, we'll start with you. Yeah, so, so let me start with something uh, that comes directly out of our paper. Uh, so one of the things that we see is that there is this kind of spillovers of perceived risk across countries. So, uh, you know, MEs that have faced like adverse conditions in, in, in regards to policy in their previous operations, they kind of carry these perceptions when they're evaluating, you know, other locations. Uh, so in that sense, one of the things that it shows is that it requires some kind of um, coordination between countries, or not only on you know setting targets for uh, climate change, but also on the uh, stability of policies. So making sure that other countries are kind of keeping this stable policy environment because that spills over to your own country. So so I think that's one thing that uh, I would think is relevant uh, for that. Great, thank you. Uh, Francesca, what, you, what do you think would be a, a key takeaway that is relevant for those negotiating in Glasgow? Yeah, I think uh, uh, the outcome of, of these uh, negotiations uh, will have an impact also on uh, what companies then yeah, will consider that could, there could be, a, it could be a, a BMSA related to energy and to the energy transition. So what could be the specific advantage for the future years for a business to invest in and to build a business model around? Um, so I think, uh, yeah, the, the message that will be given in Glasgow uh, in the negotiations will have an impact on how both uh, incumbents and we have in our paper, we show that there is really a difference between uh, uh, traditional utilities uh, uh, and uh, new entrants. So how both these actors, these kinds of actors will deal with the energy transition. Yeah, that's really fascinating. It's not, and I think that all the research is really showing it's not a one size fits all. And that's a challenge with policies, right? Because policies typically are are very broad based measures aimed to award, you know, the, the country's energy sector. And what all of our research is showing is that that one size fits all is maybe not going to really fit everyone. And so having that kind of that knowledge in the discussions could be really helpful. Marcus, how about you? Uh, maybe just to connect to the uh, not uh, one size doesn't fit all uh, idea, I guess I would emphasize what what we were seeing in our paper, which is that, uh, you know, the, the representatives for, for different countries going to Glasgow, of course, they should push for as much as they can in terms of international agreements, but they should also keep in mind that their home country um, environments are going to be very important too. That that uh, that the the international uh, level is is a very important level, but also uh, continuing. If if you're from a country that that has higher uh, higher standards, higher uh, aspirations in terms of climate, um, then go ahead and and make the changes at the at your own country level. Um, and, and that you can be kind of a, a forerunner. Uh, and then the second thing, just real quick, is again, keep in mind uh, multinationals respond to regulation um, as, as we show. And so uh, progress at the international level um, should, should have effect and, and it's going to direct the, the power of the private sector uh, in a more constructive way. So Marcus, I'm so glad that you kind of led us down that path because we have uh, one more question that is related to this idea of um, there's differences across these countries, right? And so the question is from an, a, one of our attendees that said, how effective in terms of cost will green energy products be to developing countries? And I just want to add a little bit to this question too of, what is the opportunity in terms of energy accessibility, um, energy affordability, given this transition to green energy? And Francesca, I'm going to ask you to kind of kick us off on this regard. Yeah, so I think it's uh, there is uh, there are different components to to this uh, question. So one question is one issue is related to the support that uh, uh, developed countries uh, uh, should give and can give to 
the energy transition in developing countries because this is uh, will have a key impact so what role do they will they take on that on that topic and uh, and then also the issue of uh, what kind of business models uh, can be uh, best uh, can be relevant uh, can be useful uh, uh, to uh, foster an energy transition uh, in developing countries so considering for example particularly aspect of uh, accessibility uh, techno access to technology uh, digital divide uh, uh, these are very important topics so while some models uh, can be uh, more easily implemented uh, in, uh, in developed countries, maybe in developing countries, they are not uh, as uh, successful and uh, useful for the energy transition. So the adaptation of uh, these business models is key in my view. Great, thank you. And I think bringing up especially the, the role of technology, whereas you know, in the kind of the traditional energy sector, of course, technology is important, but I think seeing in this transition, the, the green energy transition, technology is taking increasingly a more and more central place in how green energy products are developed, but especially how they are accessed by consumers. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. Uh, Panikos, how about you? What is what does this mean for developed countries? I think w w one thing that we might see is, uh, you know, the kind of leapfrogging that we saw with mobile technology, where some of the developing countries, they kind of skipped having a, uh, you know, the how do you call it, landline and, and they went directly to mobile phones. Um, and there is potential in, in many developing countries, there is kind of natural potential for renewable energy, for example. Uh, so it, it is possible to just start in some locations where there is like a kind of poor connectivity to start with renewables, uh, especially, especially solar. So uh, I would say, the, especially for developing countries, cost is less of a problem than it is for, um, uh, than, than it was in the past. Uh, what's more of a problem is what Francesca spoke about Kind of what kind of business models can we use? You know, we can't probably can't use some of the digital business models, or or maybe in some places they might be more relevant. Uh, but also, it's there. There is lack of infrastructure sometimes, and uh, skills and expertise for people to engage in these kind of ventures, uh, because th there is a lot of potential for you know small scale, uh, you know grids and um, small scale solar and and wind energy, but. Uh, what is lacking is the expertise in many places. Very interesting. Thank you for sharing that perspective. And Marcus, how about you? What, do, what are your thoughts related to the accessibility and affordability of green energy products in developing countries? Uh, well, so I think first I want to really uh, agree uh, substantially with what Panikos was just saying. I, I think there's an enormous opportunity uh, uh, for leapfrogging, so an enormous opportunity in the fact that you're not needing, you don't have this sort of uh, dug-in way of doing things already and infrastructure that you're replacing, you're, you're, you can be starting a bit more from scratch and, and, and that can be a, a big advantage. Um, I guess the other element to it is that uh, hopefully a lot of developing countries will think a little bit differently than they do in some other industries and, and be more choose to be more open um, to choose to take advantage of, of technological advances in, in other countries and and not look uh, not necessarily look to sort of figure it out by themselves um, so there, there's the opportunity to grab these these innovations from from other countries that are kind of a little bit farther down in terms of down the road in terms of doing the R&D and then, and then uh, focus on applying them um, as quickly as possible. And, and, and whereas, whereas Panico said, I think there's advantages that developing countries have in their ability to do it quickly. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Klaus, I, I know you have a burning question that you would like to ask the panelists. Yeah. So I'm going to pass it off to you. Yes, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about uh, the, the regulations are affected affecting the uh, companies and but we brought, already brought in the consumer okay and we are talking about transition to green energy but to address the underlying environmental energy scarcity issues and uh, using the energy that we have efficiently as, as at least an, as important okay and 
some of the technology progress we should have should be in terms of making better use of the energy we have, um, whether that means uh, cars using less energy or we're not using cars, but we have means of transport that don't pollute so much. And of course, ideally, um, airplanes are a much bigger problem than cars even. Um, how, how, how does the energy efficiency and the energy transition uh, debates interact? Does that, any, does that come up in any of your research? Any volunteers for the question? Well, I can maybe start. <laughs> uh, yeah, so in um, among the cases that we, we used for our sample, uh, there were uh, firms that uh, new entrants actually that were focusing on uh, uh, the management of demand of energy demand, so that were really focusing on uh, uh, energy efficiency, so not on energy production, but really on maximizing energy efficiency. And, uh, and this is a very important topic because it's not just about finding new ways uh, of producing energy that uh, are more sustainable, but it's really about changing our behavior and uh, finding ways to uh, increase the efficiency and uh, increase the energy efficiency. And uh, I'm, I'm researching digital technology, so I'm sorry if I bring it always in, but uh, I think digital technology is very important for that because it can really help to be more transparent in the management uh, of the energy that we consume and so be able to reduce it and to adjust it. And uh, yes, so that's uh, that could be an interesting option. Uh, maybe I'll jump in second. So, I mean, our, our work is fundamentally about trying to assign a price to uh, to the spillover negative externalities uh, of, of energy use. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, we would, that, that this is really where my 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 theme of of stressing that I think the answer is is usually in in pol in terms of policy uh, that that's where it comes from the idea that we consumers much like businesses I think ultimately are going to behave in pretty self interested ways um, on 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 average and so uh, let's let's help them to to add factor in. Uh, these these um, negative externalities into their into their self interested thinking, uh, pushing up prices on things that 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 ultimately in the long term uh, are costly to society. So just to add to uh, what Marcus was just saying, I I would actually say I, I'm not sure I would say consumers will behave self interestedly in in a self interested way necessarily. So I think a lot of it is that part of it is that, but. Uh, it's also that consumers don't change their habits easily. Uh, so especially when we're talking about energy um, and energy use in buildings, which is getting more and more important, especially now that a lot of us are working more from home, uh, I think we, we need to do more to nudge people to use energy differently. And of course, you know, there, there, are, um, uh, there are improvements in building design and, you know, green, green building design, um, uh, but, a lot of it is about just changing the habits of people and kind of educating people. Uh, there were many cases where uh, the the use of smart meat, so people were, had smart meters in their homes and they didn't really know how to use them and didn't really change the behavior. So it's a lot about consumer education. Uh, but I also I, I also wanted to go back to what Klaus mentioned uh, because transportation is really important there. Uh, especially, you, you know, you mentioned uh, flying like in airplanes, that's where I think it's a more challenging problem where we need to get more energy efficiency because we don't have obvious and clear solutions. When it's when we're talking about electricity production, uh, renewables are pretty much uh, in in many places already on on par with uh, non-renewables in terms of costs. But when we're talking about transportations, we're not there yet. We're not even close, uh, especially uh, for air transportation. Thank you so much, Panikos. Thank you, Marcus, Francesca. Um, Klaus, great question for the panelists. I just want to thank you all so much for presenting your research, all the attendees that shared questions with us. Of course, we couldn't get to all of them, um, but I'm sure that all of the uh, presenters would love to talk about this for longer. However, we're 
coming close on time. I do want to wrap up with a, a couple of key takeaways that I think are relevant based on what we've heard today. And that first, I'm just going to piggyback off what we were just talking about, the role of consumers, right? And we are the, we are the, the ones consuming this energy. If we want to see green energy, then that's the, the new habits that we need to develop. And um, the other thing that we talked about was relevant to consumers influencing both the m and and businesses, but also policymakers too, right? And so that's kind of our role of having that influence. Speaking of policy, we heard a lot about not all policies fit all uh, organizations, all, all of these different green energy producers or users or, you know, and so really thinking about how do we help influence policy so that it is um, encompassing that that variation, that heterogeneity and in interest in, in use and what's going to work for these different companies. So I think that's that's probably really relevant. And then the third thing that I took away, um, Panicos, I think the the word that you used was leapfrogging, right? So there, and of course, Francesca and Marcus, you spoke about these different business models that are needed. So kind of out with the old, in with the new, so to speak, but really um, the idea that how energy was produced and used in the past could be relevant for today, but there also is this huge opportunity for new ways, right? So new business models, new ways of producing energy, rethinking how we're using energy. All of these new entrants like Google and Microsoft that weren't energy producers anymore are in the game. And so what does that mean for how green energy is produced, is consumed, is used? And so I think there's there's just a, a huge horizon of questions that could be asked related to that, but also policies that could help change those behaviors. So just thank you to all of you for getting me thinking about this, getting me so excited about it. And Klaus, I will pass it off to you. Thank you all the participants for your uh, contribution today. Uh, Irene already rounded up the discussion. I, I think it triggers a lot of thoughts for a lot of people, as I can also see from the kind of comments we had in, in the in the chat and the Q and A, I hope the discussions will continue both in research forums, but also in policy forums. And we should talk to each other, the policymakers and the researchers who are uh, working on these issues. Um, the only thing that remains for me to do is to uh, remind everyone that the papers are available online. Um, and I was just about to show you, and for some reason that didn't do what I wanted it to do. Oops. Okay, we'll just do this one. Um, the papers are available online uh, in, in GIPS this year. And for some reason, do I have a bad connection on this last minute? Can you guys still hear me? Yeah, we okay, can I can't see Mark. I can't see my, my own picture, but anyway, uh, something's going on wrong on my computer. I uh, just close without showing a slide, I guess, uh, to say we have another seminar in three weeks uh, from today, and that will focus on global value chains. And we're going to look at what global value ch chains from the perspective of the developing countries, of the host countries at the lower end of the value chains. And we will feature three papers that have been published in the Journal of International Business Policy, uh, most of them currently in the advanced in line stage. Thank you, ev uh, everyone, and see you again soon in this forum. Bye. Thank you all for tuning in. Thanks. Bye.